the the bending of the blaze goes back almost over 25 years ago and was discovered kind of by accident like you're describing we used to spend a lot of time trying to make a, a meticulously like straight blade and uh, <clears throat> was a friend of mine who would became world champion in Canada, got a new pair of blades and, uh, and went about making them straight because he was really, really happy on his old blades. He skated on them, they felt terrible. Went back on his old blades, they felt great. And then he took a much closer look at his old blades and saw that the manufacturing process of the blades at the time, they were steel tubes like, like old hockey skates. And the way that they were stamped out, they had a natural little arc to them. And so he took his brand new pair and that he had just straightened and put a little bit of bend back into them. And it was like all of a sudden and realized like, okay, that feels better. And, and so all of us at the time started to very crudely put kinks in our blade. So they, so they turned better and literally at a door jam at a hotel, just cranking and leaning on a blade. And there was no other refinement at the time. Tools didn't exist yet to measure the radius and the bend, those arcs. Uh, eventually, I became frustrated, so I, I made tools. Out of necessity, I made tools to measure those arcs so you could more finely coordinate what you were doing. And that's that little uh, triangle thing you, you, you'll you put on and you're kind of looking at yes. the arc? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so that will give you extremely precise numbers. So over the past 20 gauge. years, a gauge. The, the rock or radius numbers that we use for the, for the, uh, the curvature of your blade and the yep. bend, they work hand in hand to describe a, a footprint on the ice, if you will. Minute changes in either of those two curves affect how well you glide and how well you turn. And so each skater dependent on their, their height, their weight, their technique, their speed will play very slightly with those shapes. And it's a bit like tuning suspension on a race car and you're sure. gonna make a little minor adjustments dependent on the ice conditions or the brand of the blade maybe they're a little stiffer a little softer they've got different different responsive characteristics so you will change those those two parameters do I they mean, affect that, each other and is there some ratio that most skaters are trying to play with it's it's the, the window has gradually closed there was there was a wider range of, of acceptable tuning but now it's 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 gotten narrower and narrower as the speeds have escalated, and we're and we're sort of at the outer limits of how flat you can go on a blade and still maneuver it and turn it at the speeds that they're going. As the blades have gotten gotten more refined and the speeds have gotten higher, ironically they're skating with less bend and flatter blades because they don't they don't need it and they're they're able to carry their speed better and skate faster over the longer thousand meters. 1500 meters in short track and even in long track they've been their blades and and have been for for quite a while too for the speeds that they're going at who was that canadian skater uh his name was uh louis grenier so and everyone were... around was like no wonder i'm not skating it fast <laughs> and they're just cranking on their blade the people didn't want to believe it uh that could work it was there was definitely uh some 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 head bunning at the time um outside of canada this is in quebec city at the time that didn't want to believe that that could possibly be true and this is perhaps a decade or more before shaped skis curved skis you know became parabolic skis became a thing so i mean that too drastically changed completely changed the sport what's the difference between a short track and a long track skate is it is it, other than the setup of the the blade once fixed one has the clap mechanism is there any big difference between the actual boot the boot is built quite a bit different. I think in the beginning, they were virtually the same. I mean, back in Eric Hyden's day, the only difference between a, a, sh a short track boot and a long track boot was just the height. Maybe it would be you know, an inch taller boot, lace them up a little bit higher, but there was nothing substantial on the sides of the boot, the counters, we would call it around your ankles. There was no stiffness there, nothing. Slowly, the skaters started to put uh, fiberglass on the inside of their boots to make them a little bit stiffer, both for long track and for short track. And that sort of predates a uh, composite boot that it would eventually become. And that was at the beginning of my skating career, that's what was common practice was you took an older pair of boots and if you wanted them to fit better or be stiff or have more support, you put some new counters or a fiberglass on the inside. And my thinking was at the time, well, instead of putting fiberglass or composite inside the boot, 
What if I make the whole boot out of that, softer leather to that instead of the other way around? Did you have anyone be like, you know, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking <laughs> about. And now the whole industry's changed or? There was, a, there was a few other, you know, really crucial people at the time. Great, brilliant guys like Raymond LeBear from, uh, from also from Canada who made some of the first composite boots for short track and uh, a couple other uh, builders from Europe that also played with it, but they never quite pulled all the, all the strings together. But in the beginning, yeah, I think everybody just shrugged and, and laughed and <laughs> they had no idea. I, I didn't have any idea what I was doing either, but uh, I, wasn't af- I wasn't afraid to fail. I guess maybe that's, uh, wow. that's part of getting ahead in life sometimes is not being afraid to fail.